Money stuff sucks. Not money itself so much. It buys food and shelter and clothing and it can put a man on the moon. No, it's the stuff around money, our feelings, our mind and emotions around money that sucks. Money is different than anything else in how it makes it feel about ourselves, how worthy we are, literally. In our paycheck, how valued are we at work? How much money can we bring home to support our families? How much can we contribute to charities and causes that we care about, to our communities? In relationships, how many of us have felt a power imbalance in a relationship because of money? I certainly have, and it makes me feel a bit icky and uncomfortable. We all have this relationship with money that's hidden, but it affects us dramatically. And my relationship with money was a mess a few years ago, and we don't tend to talk about it because it's so uncomfortable. So I think we should talk about it. I want to tell you today how transforming my mind and emotions around money connected me so much more deeply to the power of my money. It connected me to my family back generations, and it changed the way I live and love and hold myself in the world. So I say money stuff sucks, but if you're feeling nothing right now, I totally get it, and I'm actually totally with you. Because a couple of years ago, I would have said about money stuff, oh, I feel extremely comfortable about money stuff. I'll take some more in my bank account. Please, I don't know magically how that's going to happen exactly. Probably future me will figure that out. But hand it over. So I was a lawyer at a big law firm. I was working big law firm hours, and I was getting exhausted and burnt out. And I started getting physically ill. My stomach stopped working. I started getting fevers out of the blue, and my hair started falling out in clumps. I had to carry all these medications and pills around with me in a plastic baggie. I was on a date at that time with a guy, and I realized we were going to have to eat dinner together, and I was going to have to pull out this baggie of pills. So I figured, okay, fine, he's either going to run right now or he's going to stay. And I pulled out this baggie of pills and plumped it on the table, and he just stared at me. And I was just like, oh my God, I'm such a mess. I was such a mess. I was under so much stress that I was desperate to find another way out, but I couldn't afford it. So I had to become invested in my life. I turned to something I had known about my whole life, but never wanted to do. I turned to my dad. My dad is an investor, he has a hedge fund, and he invests in the style of Warren Buffett, which is um, choosing wonderful companies with great fundamentals and holding them generally for a long time. But I had avoided learning from him my entire life, despite having this father who wanted to teach me. We tend to avoid things that are deeply uncomfortable, often without knowing exactly why. And for me, it was planning for the future and getting involved in the stock market through my dad. For somebody else, it'll be worrying about those painful credit card bills that you don't even want to look at or touch. For another person, it'll be feeling like you don't deserve the money you have, so you don't use it or spend it or risk it, ever. For me, it was the stock market. And that fear was legitimate, because the stock market can be really dangerous if you don't know what you're doing. And I didn't want to have the responsibility of losing this money and having it be all my fault. I'm generally, to this day, terrible with numbers. And I had lived through the dot-com bubble and the recession, and the real estate bubble and the recession. So when I think about the stock market back then, I felt like I was entering a dimly lit parking garage late at night into an enclosed, dark, concrete stairwell with heavy doors at both ends, and my radar is going off saying, girl, don't go in that concrete stairwell. When I think about the stock market, my reaction is, get the hell out of that enclosed concrete stairwell and call an Uber, it's worth the surge pricing. <laughs> so I found a solution to this surface-level problem of being afraid of losing my money in the market. And that was simply education and practice, which I got from my dad. But then I discovered a greater, person, a greater purpose to this whole investing shenanigan thing. With my consumer money, I always try to buy products from companies with a mission of integrity, that treat employees well, treat animals well, don't use pesticides or bio, organic, free trade, all the stuff nobody talked about 30 years ago. By demanding better and voting with our money, we consumers have changed our options dramatically. 
We've gone from bio and organic products being available in grocery stores in tiny, hard to find shops to now being available in the front of supermarkets right there for us. And that's not out of the goodness of the hearts of the grocery companies. It's because we consumers took our money away from them until they changed. So it occurred to me, why couldn't I do this with my investing money the same way I did with my consumer money? I had to start thinking of my money as a vote. My money represents me, and my vote matters, just like it does at the ballot box. But I still somehow couldn't quite connect to this investing practice or to my money. So why was I still freaking out about this and feeling like I was in this enclosed concrete stairwell? I finally sat down. I reached deeply inside my fear. And I realized it didn't actually have much to do with the stock market at all. I could learn that stuff. It had to do with me. What had happened was that I, when I first started engaging with my money, I actually started engaging with my feelings around money, that money stuff, my feelings about security, safety, about my relationships, about who I am, about my worth. And this investing thing became so much larger than what was in my bank account. And it had to, because when you truly engage with the power of your own money, it transforms you internally bringing something out of this dark fog into the light by talking about it makes it shine. It becomes life supporting. Without using it, we're missing out on this connection to ourselves and especially to each other. Because if we don't engage on a deep level with the power of our money, we are abdicating that power. It's still there, but we're not using it. We all have a relationship to money that we were taught as kids and a relationship with money as adults that comes from that. Every single one of us, whether you are rich or poor or in the middle, it doesn't matter. We all have one. And engaging with my relationship with money and my money stuff forced me to go through three steps. They changed how invested I am in myself and how my money represents me. So the first step was to become aware of this relationship with money and to face it. For me, I thought, why am I not getting into this practice fully? I realized I was afraid because of my teacher. I didn't completely trust my dad, which on its face is silly because he's very well respected in the investing world. He went on CNBC and called the 2008 market crash. He knows what he's doing. When I was 11, my parents got divorced and they went to war and my dad left and he took the money with him. Now, once he realized that he had done this to his children, he came back and he made sure we were well taken care of and my parents ended up settling things without lawyers and we all have a good relationship now. But that happened. That's in me and it marked me because money can be safety, right? Especially for kids. And I had never thought back to the money part of that divorce experience it was covered up by so many other things that had happened, and it was uncomfortable. So here I was, having avoided my dad's investing knowledge most of my life because I'm not good with numbers and the stock market is so scary. And that's my money stuff back there, deep within me. I had to become aware of it and face it so that I could move through it when those feelings come up, which they still do for me. I told a good friend about this, we were sitting at dinner, and she immediately goes, Oh yeah, my parents were gamblers. And when I was a kid, they would come around the house and if I left any money out on the bedside table, they would take it. They would just steal money from me. So I learned never to leave money out and I thought all kids had parents who stole money from them. And it wasn't until she went to university that she discovered that some parents don't steal money from their kids. None of us have a clue when we're kids about these money experiences because it's hard to see outside of our own experience and our perspective, first of all, but also because we don't talk to each other about money. It's not until we get older and we start to hear about these things through relationships that we can actually get some perspective on how our paradigm around money was framed. The second step that I went through was to be thankful for the good parts of what happened that set me up in my life. Yes, I went through a bad divorce as a kid. So did a lot of other people. And there are many, many worse things that happen to kids. I'm incredibly privileged in a million ways. My own dad was now trying to teach me investing personally. Being thankful for what happened shifted this experience with money that I went through. It lightened it. It made it manageable. 
and it made me feel comfortable enough to finally talk to my dad about it. I discovered that we have a generational legacy of how we feel about money, and it changes with the experiences and attitudes of each generation. So I went to talk to him, and initially, of course, my dad said, no, 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 I don't have any issues with money at all, except that I want some more of it. Like, classic money manager. And I said, we all have some relationship with money, and I know you do, because I know your parents. And he said, oh yeah, well, it's true that my parents, and especially my grandparents, so my great-grandparents, he said that they implied that money was the root of all evil, and that rich people got wealthy by grubbing their way there so that they could rub it in everybody's faces with their limousines and their big houses. I mean, that's negative. And it almost sounds to me like they felt money kept them from living their values as good people. So I asked my dad, how did you break out from this mindset so that you could become successful? And he said, I just did it. Once I made some money and started to realize that I could still be me, then I started to see it was okay. And then he told me about my grandmother. Now, my grandmother is a take-charge kind of woman in a 1950s housewife world. If she had been born today, she would be running the world. But at that time, she had a couple small businesses, some restaurants, but nothing more. And he said after he made some money, he was financing a housing development. And he offered it to her to run, which she would have been amazing at. And she said no. And she didn't actually say this to him, but his implication was that it was a leap too far, and something in her did not want to be one of those people, those rich people. And she was afraid. She just couldn't see herself like that. And when he said this to me, I thought, oh my gosh, she's just like me, and I'm just like her feeling that enclosed concrete stairwell feeling, being afraid to step into my own power because I can't imagine myself being truly connected to my money and having it represent me well in the world. But look at how much has changed in only a few generations. That's part of my family tradition with money that draws a red thread through the generations, the stuff they went through, the stuff my parents went through, and now the stuff I'm going through. Each transformation, generation by generation, passing down the legacy of struggle, of wanting a better life for our kids, and our own relationship with money. We can create a generational legacy of wealth and connection to the power of our money, and I have the opportunity to make that change. So here's how I did it. The third step is to transform my awareness of what happened into my own new tradition. Trust that by facing what you went through and being thankful for that tradition, you will create your own new tradition with money that's personal to you. So I connected to the power of my money. My money was now a part of me, and it represents me in the world. So what I do with it reflects on me. For me and my new tradition, I took something I saw as negative and scary and made it into something where my money, as my vote, would be used consciously and well. Imagine what would happen if those of us who don't invest right now also faced our fears and transformed our relationship with money and started to fight for those wonderful companies out there. We would do more than just choose free trade bananas at the grocery store. We, the small little guy investors, actually control most of the money in the global stock markets. It just doesn't look like it because it's invested through large funds. But imagine what would happen if we took our power back and our votes back by taking our money back and put it into conscious companies with strong missions and honorable management. The way people do business would change, and our own personal investing accounts would change and grow right along with it. We would literally change the global stock market from one that rewards short-term profits to one that rewards long-term stakeholder gains, and it would start to happen very quickly. Finding great companies and being able to support them with my money made me feel like a warrior from my couch. And that's how, by transforming my relationship to money, it connected me to my family, to my family tradition, and to my world around me. I married that guy who wasn't scared off by my baggie of pills, and I stopped needing the pills. And I don't think it's a coincidence that it happened at the same time as I was becoming invested in my life in a much deeper way. I hope you will put your money in places and with people that deserve your trust and your vote. And I send you the power to feel your own worth and enjoy the journey. I wish you a beautiful practice. 
Thank you.